I was at home on that night. It was just me and my two children at the time in the house. I woke up and I could smell burning. It reminded me of um, like when you burn plastic. And I looked out into the passageway. Everything looked normal, so I went back to sleep. But my oldest son came into my room and then he said, uh, Mommy, I think there's a fire. So I got up out of my bed, I went straight to the window, and when I looked out the window, I could see um, flying embers. And I'm obviously on the 17th floor, so that's not a good sign. I heard some shouting. So I got out of bed, opened my front door, and this just smoke just came like billowing through the front door. just like sunk. This is something really serious, you know. I'm speaking to my family on the phone, uh, but I'm also watching it on TV simultaneously. Initially, I told them to leave the flat. They couldn't. The hallway was full of smoke. Black smoke, she couldn't see past her hand. Again, I know, because I could see on the TV that the fire's actually spreading from the outside, so it's getting bad. Do I tell her to go, or do I tell her to wait? And not knowing what to do, the most humbling stage of my life, isn't it? I was awoken by sirens. We went to go and couldn't get out. By that point, the hallway was pitch black. The fire started at 5 to 1 and got rescued officially at 4.47. Stayed from lost family to be rescued from the tower. My uncle lived four floors above me, so he never made it out. To tell the child, unfortunately. So, as me and my sister were running down the stairs, there was no obvious signs of any kind of fire, there was no obvious signs of us being in any danger. Went onto the green, and the fire wasn't, hadn't even come out of the building yet. We kind of saw the fire develop the way that it did. First of all, it, we saw it like break the window and come out. Then we saw the fire start climbing, and climbing and climbing until the point it reached the top floor. Sounds that you associate with fire in the background, but overlaid with screaming and people shouting from their windows, begging for help. And you kind of just felt powerless looking at them because nothing that you could do would be able to help them. As we got to the bottom of the ground floor, there was firefighters running in to go up the stairs. And then I've looked up at the tower and literally just one corner from the bottom to the top is on fire. It looked like I was in a movie or something. It was like a dream. I remember just thanking my oldest son, like, thank you for waking up, thank you for waking me up. I started panicking, both hands pouring at the wall. I started breathing in this smoke. Just at that moment, a firefighter came onto our landing. He found me. And then I just, like, just bolted down the stairs for my life. Immediate reaction to what happened by some elements of the press was to portray Grenfell as being full of illegal immigrants, full of uh, illegal subletting, work shy, sponges. 
That could not have been farther from the truth. The evidence is, is that there was no subletters living in Grenfell and there was no illegal immigrants. I think that Grenfell was a community that was full of hard-working primary school teachers, social workers, bankers, and of course, you know, every community has its share of people who are slightly more vulnerable, slightly less able to work, and we looked after them, we kept an eye on them. That was the community that we lived in. We had this community that was built, you know, almost in a unique way in a tower block. We're never, ever, ever now going to be able to show the world what a great community Grenfell was. There was a real sense of community within the tower. I don't know where that stems from. I don't know how that came about, but in the 10 years I lived there, it was just embedded in the tower and it was just embedded in the culture of the tower and where everyone stuck together, everyone would support each other, look out for each other, help each other. People from all different backgrounds, all different cultures, everyone knew each other, that everyone was connected in some way. So you might meet someone and they're cousins with someone who you're in school with or someone that you work with. So everyone kind of knew each other. I wouldn't live anywhere else. I still remember how it smells, you know? It had a, it had a smell when you walked in there, you know? It was a mixture of like the lift, like the smell of the material of the lift and just different people's foods, you know? And I was, yeah. I always loved that. I loved being there, loved it, you know. It's sad because it was almost like a community within a community, you know, a family within a family. And it's gone. Out of the blue, I received a call from the council and they said to me, oh, it's the 17th floor in a tower block. And I said, nah, I'm okay. But because it was a direct offer, they basically said to me, I have no choice. I moved in maybe six weeks later and once I actually moved in I really enjoyed the space. I was really excited because it was my permanent property and it was the first time that I was able to actually put my own kind of like stamp on my property so it was really exciting for me. The first room I started off in was the boys room. On one side of their their walls, they had um, like these hexagon shapes that I had drawn on the wall, like literally from the bottom right to the top. I had to like measure it out and make sure they were all straight. Um, I had to put tape around them and I um, coloured them in different colours, the colours that they wanted in their room, which was black, yellow, silver. And I coloured in all the hexagons in these um, colours. And um, like literally, it looks professional. It looked like I had an interior designer that had come in. But so I was really, really proud of how their room looked. And that was the first time they were ever able to be in a room that they had designed themselves. So it was really nice for them to just have that space. I really liked my home. I was there for nearly 17 years. It was a wonderful place. I felt very, very comfortable and very happy there. The thing about our old homes is that they were so spacious. I had a vast like sitting room, then I had like a nice kitchen and a separate bedroom, a little bathroom and a hallway that, that ran through it. I had everything that I needed there. It was a home that literally felt like it was in the clouds, away from all the hustle and bustle of life, and that's, that is what I really, really loved about living in Grenfell Tower. I would chart like where the sun would set, you know, in summertime and in wintertime, and 21st of June being the longest day, I was looking forward to seeing how far the sun would go towards the right when it was setting, but I obviously didn't get to have that opportunity because the fire took place on the 14th. I turn the corner and there's like a row of firefighters crying on the floor. You know, they couldn't make it past the, the, the 19th or 20th floor. I didn't know the severity of the situation. I didn't know exactly what was going on. 
and I was walking into my nan's house and I just, I just looked up and I was just like, no, no, Uncle Hisham can't be in there. Kept calling Uncle Hisham's phone, it just kept ringing. We kept thinking he was in the hospital because his phone was ringing. That's what we were holding on to for a very, very long time. You know, he was, he was a massive part of my life growing up. He'd put his arm around me and, and, that, and that said a million things. And he'd be like, don't worry, Karim, you know, everything's going to be all right. And it, and it made it okay. You know, I remember him teaching me stuff, you know, how to tie my tie and about stuff about work. And Uncle Hisham sort of naturally took that sort of father figure role. After Grenfell happened, we, um, we got close to his friends. She would tell us how much we meant, how, how much the small moments really meant to him, how happy he was when we moved in together and, and how happy he was when, when we got our house. He wasn't expressing it very much, but obviously to her he did. He was probably the closest to what granddad is and, you know, they don't, they don't have that no more. And I'm saying to Nan, like, what happened? When did you speak to him? And she's telling us, I spoke to him. He said that the smoke was coming into his room. He said to her that he was going to call her back, and he didn't call her back. It was a traumatic time because obviously people um, have come and um, they're asking about their loved ones. Just a unique, bad, horrible time. And it was a community, you know, that came and helped us. It was like people from Port Bella Rugby Club came and got us and said, look, we've opened up the rugby club, come. These guys coming from, from a mosque in the East End or something, with water and... Yeah, it was difficult. There was people coming from different parts of London, people coming from out of London just to help. People were shocked and disgusted what had happened and, and we were screamless until we were blue in the face. We were left. The fire happened on a Wednesday the council would not come and meet with us till the Friday. Two days, we were just basically left. And if it wasn't for the community, we would have nothing. I remember I came out in just my sliders of the fire. I had just my sliders on, and it was someone from the community, a girl I didn't even know, who was like, what shoe size are you? And went and got me a pair of trainers for my house. And if it honestly wasn't for places like Rugby, Rugby Portobello, Harrow Club, the mosques, the churches, if it wasn't for them places, like we would have, what, been literally sleeping on the street, probably. The community, especially the youngsters, they are the heroes of Grenfell, or the Grenfell aftermath, right? First responders were young Muslim men running from the mosque. They're the ones that came and they tried to do whatever they could to help people, and they did. It was an absolute war zone in the community. Um, donations were all over the place. Volunteers, lots of people wanting to help. The area was just flooded with people. We were just covered in, in like this crap, just walking around the area, just covered in these, like, these ashes. And I remember the smell, you know, like when you burn plastic. And I think this is the moment where I realised something messed up is going on here. There was refurbishment work that was done on the building and a lot of people are saying that there were things that weren't done properly. Maybe there's something a little bit more sinister going on here. We'd spent years and years and years trying to voice and voicing our concerns about how we were being treated. The fact was is that we weren't listened to when we did articulate and we did raise our concerns. It was because we were treated like we didn't have a voice, because we weren't treated with respect, we weren't treated with humanity, that Grenfell was allowed to happen. No one that came out of that evening, whether they're bereaved or whether they're survivors, can do so in a manner that leaves them unscathed. It was the most extreme violence. We will always be touched by what happened. 
I didn't cry, I didn't, I didn't do any of those type of things. Because I had younger children as well, I, that was my main concern, that was my main priority, and I felt like I needed to be strong for them. They were still in shock. Um, even when we moved into the hotel um, that night, they wanted to do like um, a fire drill, just to see like if there was a fire, how would we escape? Um, like where are the fire exit doors? They became a lot more aware of um, how to escape in a fire. And that's something that hasn't left them to this, this time, you know. I always had like a brave face on in front of them, but inside, more than anything, I was angry. Um, I was angry to be put in a situation where we're put into a building that is unsafe. When you're in that position, or that predicament, I think you think to yourself, well, actually, someone's going to come and save the day, right? That's what happens, and you're going to get the fire brigade, the police, whatever, they're going to sort it out, and this is, this is like, yeah, we're going to be all right. But then they don't. For a lot of people, they don't. So now we're out of the tower. Surely the council, the police, the government, the, well, whoever it is, are going to be a wrap around us and make sure that we're all right. But then they don't. And then you go on and you're carrying on day after day, hour after hour, week after week, kind of expecting the authorities or the right people to actually do the right thing and safeguard you and, and protect you and, and make sure that you're all right. But they don't. The one thing that I've always known is they don't care about us. They have a duty of care towards us, and they have a duty of care towards this community, and they've neglected it for so long. It's no longer avoidable. It's no longer avoidable. Truth, justice, and change. The truth is coming out. The truth is coming out. They won't be able to avoid that. The truth will come out. Yes, we want criminal prosecutions. Yes, we want them to be treated the same way that you treat our communities for decades. You commit a petty crime in the community, you're gonna get slapped with the law, you're gonna go to jail, simple as. Why is there a double standard? We've lost 72 people, yeah? 72 of our loved ones, kids, elderly, brothers, sisters, wives, and what have you. There is no, nothing worse that can happen to you. For you to say, okay, so-and-so went to prison, so-and-so went to prison, so-and-so, absolutely, that needs to happen. And especially the big names, right? But then, does it just get forgotten about? Grenfell has become that symbol, right? It has become that symbol of injustice. And unless change comes with it, then that's an injustice in itself. The first month after the fire was like, I had this kind of yoke of angst on my, sh on my, my shoulders, this kind of feel of like feeling of just total dread, total dread. No one's helping us. Fifth richest country in the world, 21st century. We couldn't even look after our own people. It was just, it was just disgusting. So they felt invincible, and then that night they realised that everything that they'd done was going to be scrutinised, that the world was going to be focused on what they'd done. And I think they were trying to come to terms with how they were going to deal with that. Even on the night that they, they, they'd caused that much violence and that much upset, they were just concerned with how they would look, how it was going to impact on them, how are we going to deal with this story. To be that let down by those with responsibility and to be so looked after by those who had no responsibility, and in fact by communities that are, you know, pretty much vilified and, you know, become the, the scapegoat for our hatred and our ignorance. That hurt, that hurt. There were days where I'd go home and I'd just think about what happened and properly try and understand that I've lost my house, 
I've lost my, f my friends, I've lost my neighbours, and you just spiral down out of control. So you just had to put that at the back of your mind and try and, to the best of your ability, push through. This isn't just a problem that will go away if you forget about it. There have been many fires that have happened already since the tower. Fortunately, no one has died, but these fires will continue to happen until someone does something about it. And if we're not here to hold these people to account, then no one will. The reason I do it is because we've lost people. You know, whether you're bereaved or you're a survivor, you've lost people. And our fight continues because of that loss. There's a lot of people that have lived in silence for so long, you know, that's what we did in Grenville Tower itself, you know, people would have issues with their homes and just wouldn't say anything for fear of even not being listened to or just it never being done. So you kind of resign yourself to the fact that it's just no point complaining. We've had how many near misses? There was the big fire in Barking, there was a fire in South London last like there's been so many near misses. So the inquiries, findings and recommendations need to be implemented because they're these recommendations are to save lives. Losing any family member is tough. Losing them the way we, we, we lost our family. You know, it should, every time we think about it, you get so angry, you know? You know, and I feel like we're trapped in this emotional sort of place with these negative emotions because there's no closure. And it feels like no one's really trying to do anything about that, apart from us. And that's why it's frustrating. If we don't try to do something or nothing's going to happen and I can't move on by just accepting the fact that, you know, our families were killed in this way and that's it. You know, we didn't even have him back properly to, to, to put him to rest. I think it's difficult to lose somebody, you know, in general, but what is even more difficult is when you lose somebody so publicly. It all happened in front of our eyes, you know. It's almost like you have two lives. You had a life before Grenfell and you have a life after Grenfell. And they're two completely different things. People say time heals. So I haven't really found that to be the case. The impact is, has been unimaginable. It has been crazy to an office. It's brought the best in the West in me. We are unified just through what we experienced and what we continue to go through. We have an inquiry, we've got a criminal investigation that has taken place at the moment. I hope both of them bring about big change, you know, not just subtle change, but actual big change where um, people are going to be able to feel safer in their houses. It's a tragedy that hit everybody in that community and that was my community, that's what I've lived in, that's what, you know, every walk of life, every nationality, every colour, creed, you know, religion lived in that block and for me that that's the first 41 years of my life. We need to get justice delivered to us. Justice delayed is justice denied, and that injustice can only be ameliorated by change coming. I hope that we can find some healing on an individual level. For the survivors, I hope that they find a way of moving on. But for all of us, I, I hope that we can get the justice and the change that needs to come as a result of 72 innocent people losing their lives.